So I'd like to review the current findings on high intensity focused ultrasound. And I'll start by speaking on selection and outcomes for whole gland treatment. We'll then go into uh, focal ablation and then a few comments with salvage HIFU. Regarding general selection criteria, the ideal gland volume is less than 40 cc's with minimal calcifications that would interfere with transmission of sound waves. As noted in the whole gland HIFU series, uh, larger glands can be downsized with pre-procedural TERP or neoadjuvant ADT, particularly to reach anterior lesions. Now, anterior lesions can be particularly troublesome with HIFU because of a longer distance from the probe uh, <clears throat> and also energy absorption by intervening tissue as well as some of the progressive edema that one gets during treatment. Also, HIFU is a time-dependent treatment and it works quite well for focal because you're treating a smaller volume. Post-treatment um, includes interval PSA, MPMRI, but treatment success is ultimately defined by negative biopsies of the post-ablation zone, typically done six to 12 months after treatment. The published e experience of HIFU for whole gland primary treatment uh, for prostate cancer is derived from retrospective reviews at several large international centers. And here you see the five largest published series, each including over 500 treated patients with long-term follow-up uh, as long as 14 years. The selection criteria uh, that was reported in whole gland series includes good life expectancy and greater than 95% of cases in each of these series are T2 or lower except for the most recent report by uh, Dickinson et al., uh, whereby 15% uh, of cases were T3 lesions, uh, but none were metastatic. And up to 14% of the cases in each series were Gleason 8 or higher. All series used Avotherm, except for the one by Dickinson, which used Sonoblate. Uh, you can note here the differences in gland volume. Um, uh, and this also has to do with um, uh, downsizing with ADT or TERP. Uh, Preoperative ADT was administered anywhere from 13 to 59 percent in each series, and there was wide variability in the use of preoperative downsizing TERP. Two centers performed TUR before most ablations, while the other groups in general did not. Oncologic efficacy is measured with post-treatment biopsies biochemical recurrence, the need for salvage intervention, and survival. The definition of biochemical disease-free survival was based on the Phoenix criteria for most of these reports. Regarding biopsy, there was a wide variation in the number of patients undergoing post-treatment biopsy, ranging from 32 percent in the Dickinson study up to 83 percent in the Uchida series. The rate of positive biopsies in these five series range from 13 to 47 percent. Patients that required salvage therapy was typically less than 20 percent, although it was reported to be as high as 34 percent in men with high risk disease who were treated. Cancer specific survival was greater than 97 percent in all series who reported on this outcome. Uh, and it's worth noting that uh, overall survival in the Munich series that comprised 78 percent of men with intermediate and high risk disease features was comparable to the general male Bavarian population during the same study period. So overall, as you can see here, we had a, a very favorable uh, low PSA uh, NADA. And in terms of functional outcomes, uh, preservation of erectile function in preoperatively potent men ranged anywhere between 25 to 55 percent. Regarding continence, Dickinson et al. reported that 88 percent of patients pad-free before treatment remain so in similar fashion after HIFU. Reports of grade two or higher incontinence was limited to less than 5 percent. Sebastian Cruze and group uh, reported placement of an artificial urinary sphincter in 3 percent and a male sling in 2 percent of patients. Regarding complications, the most reported complication was bladder outlet obstruction, including bladder neck contracture, urethral stenosis, and 
uh, this occurred in up to 28% of cases. Fistula incurred in less than 0.7% and was associated with earlier treatment year and also repeat procedures. And the need for secondary interventions endoscopically was as high as 24 to 30%. Regarding primary focal ablation, according to a recent consensus meeting published in 2015 on focal therapy. All risk categories can potentially be treated focally. However, in the case of low risk patients, it should really only be due to the patient refusing active surveillance or feeling uncomfortable with it. Also, perhaps patients who drop out of active surveillance due to psychological factors. Uh, <clears throat> focal therapy can be entertained if there's a lesion to, uh, to be seen and ablated. For high-risk patients on the other side of the spectrum, metastasis need to be ruled out, and the sweet spot is the intermediate risk patient. They're considered the best candidates, particularly if a targetable lesion is present. Uh, and one of the principles is that potentially if the Gleason 7 is ablated, this can recirculate the patient back into the active surveillance pool. As we heard this morning, MPMRI is the ideal tool to characterize localized lesions fit for focal therapy. It's important for treatment planning, size, location, suspicion score, and proximity to critical structures. All lesions should be mapped out in a three-dimensional space, and all radiographically suspicious lesions should be biopsy confirmed before being ablated. The quality, as Scott told us this morning, is also paramount. 3T is ideal. At Duke, we use a 3T plus an endorectal coil. Um, you need a good reader. And I'll show you a, a study that we did in terms of uh, uh, overreading uh, uh, MRIs. For patients with a positive biopsy but a non suspicious MRI, we perform transperineal mapping biopsies. And I know the UCL group uh, does as well. This is done through the five millimeter grid template has a very high fidelity for localizing clinically significant cancers. There's still no consensus, though, if multipyrometric MRI can substitute for TTMB, which is especially useful, again, if there's no visible radiographic lesion. Again, MPMRI at this point is considered the, uh, <clears throat> the best uh, imaging modality uh, for planning and follow-up. But there's a few downsides to this as well. It needs to be kept in mind. And this is from the FDA. Uh, they had their panel uh, the other year. But the sensitivity is low at only 47%. And as was mentioned this morning, it tends to underestimate the tumor volume by um, 0 0.5 cc's. There's a study in the Journal of Urology this past month that talks about a good majority of the volume may be missed with multiparametric MRI even in centers of excellence as reported by the UCLA group. Contemporary outcomes of focal high ablation are derived from studies typically performed in trial settings, many of which utilize hemiablation, just like the cryotherapy trials. Uh, the cohorts include both sonoblate and ablotherm for the most part, with one trial reporting on the use of the new focal one machine. There are eight published series of patients treated in the last decade with focal HIFU, totaling 357 patients. The largest group is 111 from Richemont, uh, which represents a multi-institutional registry initiated by the French Urological Association. Most limit to localized disease and less than Gleason 3 plus 4. Uh, the recent index ablation case by Ahmed et al included two patients with T3A disease. All other series were limited to T2 tumors, and there's a small subset of patients with high-risk disease included in three of these studies. Most include staging MPMRI with or without template biopsy, and then MPMRI reevaluation after treatment with rebiopsy again between six and 12 months following HIFU. One of the benefits of focal treatment is that neoadjuvant hormones or pretreatment TERP is typically not performed in contrast to whole gland therapy. 
Now, most studies presented here uh, are based on hemiblation, just like Dr. Jones talked about uh, for focal cryo. Post-treatment biopsy outcomes are reported in seven of these series. Fejo et al. noted 84% negative biopsy rate in the treatment zone at 12 months, with an overall negative biopsy rate of 75% when including out-of-field positive biopsies. Richman and coworkers found that negative biopsies were greater than 90% in both the treated and untreated lobes, and 14 men went on to curative intent HIFU surgery or radiation. Only one study incorporated the use of HIFU to target the index lesion supported by Ahmed and coworkers. They noticed a high positive biopsy rate, 42%, because they're doing a very cone down treatment. Uh, Ahmed et al. noticed that 15% had residual clinically significant disease uh, in the follow-up biopsy in the treated zone, with an additional two patients uh, outside the treated zone. In terms of functional parameters, uh, these series reflect the advantage of a focal approach, the preservation of erectile function, and urinary continence. Almost all studies report on preserved erectile function of greater than 75% in preoperatively potent patients and the continence rate of over 95%. Complications, urinary tract infection, retention, self-resolving dysuria hematuria were the most common. There was a single report of a fistula, or was thought to be a fistula, that was successfully managed in a conservative uh, manner. Endoscopic intervention occurred in 5% in Ahmed's index ablation series. This is an interesting report coming from Van Velthoven's group reporting the results of their hemi hyphu ablation technique, and they matched that to unilateral cancer uh, patients who underwent robotic prostatectomy. Uh, this was a matched peer analysis, and they were matched for Gleason PSA in clinical stage, again, all unilateral cancer, and they looked at the outcome as salvage-free uh, therapy survival. They said it wasn't significantly different between surgery and hemiablation, but the HIFU group did have higher rates of preserved potency and urinary continence. Switching gears to salvage HIFU. As a comparison, Hoagland's salvage HIFU for radiorecurrent prostate cancer has demonstrated short-term oncological outcomes comparable to other modalities, but with similarly high side effects. Murad et al. Uh, reported progression-free survival at three years, 53% for low-risk patients, 42% for intermediate, and 25% for high-risk. Urinary incontinence was noted in 48%, and 11% of those men required the artificial urinary sphincter. In terms of focal salvage cryo, Ahmed et al. tried to spare the apex to preserve the external sphincter to potentially reduce incontinence. He performed salvage hemi or quadrant ablation in 39 patients and demonstrated three-year biochemical uh, disease-free survival in 63%, with 64% of patients being PAD-free and 87% overall PAD-free. One fistula was noted. Baco et al. delivered hemi-salvage high food to 48 men following radiation, confined to one lobe on MRI. Progression-free survival at 24 months was 52%, and overall 75% of men were PAD-free. Four developed bilateral recurrence, forehead risk recurrence in the uh, uh, untreated lobe, six had metastatic disease, and two had PSA-only recurrence. This is a recent multi-institutional retrospective study on post-radiation salvage HIFU, comprising 418 men, which demonstrated good short-term oncological control with cancer-specific survival of 82% and post-treatment PSA nadir of 0 0.19. That was achieved after a mean of 10 weeks. And you can see at the bottom, uh, at seven years, 
82% cancer-specific survival and 81% metastasis-free survival. In the same study, Sebastian Cruze and coworkers looked at factors associated with salvage HIFU failure and recurrence and found that the ones that, that uh, were noted were history of ADT use, pre-salvage Gleason score, and the pre-salvage PSA level. A study from Shaw et al., this is published July 2016 on salvage HIFU, showed that post-HIFU PSA nadir was the best predictor of overall survival. And for example, the progression-free survival when including all patients was 72%. You can see that here at one year. But when you look at only people who responded, i.e. those that achieved a PSA nadir, the progression-free survival improved to 86% at one year. Another recent perspective series regarding salvage HIFU also identified PSA nadir of less than 0 0.5, as reported in the, uh, the previous study by Shaw et al. as a significant predictor of biochemical uh, relapse from uh, freedom of survival. Five-year overall survival was 88%, uh, cancer-specific survival, 94%. From a functional point of view, the latest salvage HIFU series reporting continence ranges ranging from 3 to 31 percent. There's a high rate of bladder outlet obstruction with one series demonstrating the need for bladder neck incision in 54 percent of men. Fistula rates range between 0 0.6 to 9 percent and erectile function in general is worse following treatment. So in summary, for whole gland, there's good cancer specific survival but a high post HIFU positive biopsy rate. High rates of bladder neck contracture that require intervention, and for focal ablation, MRI is necessary. Short and midterm outcomes look promising, but longer follow-up and prospective trials are necessary. And regarding salvage ablation, PSA nadir is associated with biochemical relapse-free survival, and we need better techniques to minimize some of these side effects. Thank you.